going to start with kind of the facts, right? The fact is that I don't need to remind anybody that over the past six months, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have changed worldwide in a lot of areas and a lot of industries. And undoubtedly for many of us, it has been um, unfortunately stressful and very disruptive. But being the eternal optimist that I am, um, as an educator, I actually find this to be a very fascinating opportunity to step back and take a look at the effects that COVID-19 and the recent focus on racial injustice has had on industries and, and more specifically on the beauty industry. Um, you know, it's changed consumer behavior significantly. And when consumer behavior changes, brands change. And when brands change, retailers change. And so, so many things have shifted that it's a really exciting time to look at that and then to kind of compare that to previous times in our world and in our industry, because everything that goes around comes around. So as I say to the students, what's happening now, I can guarantee you, you'll see somewhere again in the future in hopefully a much more positive light. So health and beauty is incredibly important to our well-being. And as such, in that case, because of that, um, the beauty industry has become this fascinating case study. And uh, it, it, we're learning the uh, temporary effects that have happened in the industry, as well as some permanently, potentially permanently um, effects that are not gonna go away. So the good news is I'm not the only person to totally geek out on this type of information. I actually have four other people joining me today who are just as fascinated about the shifts in the industry. So I wanna ask my panelists to please join me on screen right now and let me introduce you to some fellow FITM students and alumni. So, all right, so who I wanna to introduce to you first is gonna be Sammy Blackman and Shira Berman. So Sammy and Shira are both current students. They um, have their AAs already in beauty marketing and product development. And then they just completed their third year advanced beauty industry management program and are currently enrolled in their bachelor of science degree in business management. So we've been keeping them busy, but they're here today to talk to us about a few things. Um, specifically, let me introduce Shira. Shira is a makeup artist. She has had the opportunity for a number of internships while she's been at AFIDM. Um, she interned at Petite and Pretty, and currently she's the social marketing intern at Hourglass Cosmetics. Um, Sammy also has interned. She interned for Better Skin Company and Wolf 36, and she currently, oh, yeah, and she currently works in a retail store and is the social media coordinator for Namie's Beauty Supply. So, um, Robin and Inger, can, are you here? Am I just not seeing you? There's you are, sorry. Let me introduce also Robin and Inger. So Robin and Inger are um, both FITM alums. Robin is the founder of the Holistic Beauty Group. Uh, she, that is a leading product development consultancy specializing in clean beauty and wellness. Robin's been a driving force behind the industry's trends towards clean beauty, sustainable, and safe ingredients for about two decades, I believe, at this point, right, Robin? I'm not going to try to age you. I was going to tell everybody what year you guys graduated, and then I decided that wouldn't necessarily be very nice of me. So Robin has created products for industry giants, including um, Estee Lauder, Smashbox, and Arbonne. Uh, and I'm super excited to say that Robin was profiled as a top 25 Black women in beauty in 2020, and also was featured in Essence Magazine in, in 2020. And some of her clients have included Pattern Beauty, Sagely Naturals, Versed, and We the People. Um, Inger, also a FITM alum, she graduated with a Beauty Industry Merchandising Marketing AA, and then went on to get her BA at Cal State Northridge. She's been in the industry for over 15 years, and she's managed a diverse assortment of brands and launched over several hundred products. She's recently, as in really recently, as in a week ago, <laughs> become the Director of Marketing for One Size Beauty. Prior to that, she was the Assistant Vice President of Global Marketing at NYX Professional Makeup. 
She also relaunched Paul Mitchell and Jaffra Color Cosmetic Brands, and as well has incubated, incubated a number of brand concepts that target Gen Z and millennials specifically. Her passion for serving the consumer has played an instrumental role in the growth of these companies that she's worked for. So thank you all for being here. I am super honored and excited to have you come and share your insights with us. So, what I'm gonna do to kind of get us started and turn it over to someone other than me is I'm gonna turn things over to Sammy and Shira. So Robin and Inger, we'll catch up with you a little later. All right, um, and we'll get started with the share screen here. Thank you, Shira. So let me explain a little bit about the project that the students did and why Sammy and Shira are here to present this to you today. So as I mentioned, um, they just finished their third year in the advanced beauty industry management program at FITM. And the capstone project in that program is the students are issued a real world project by leading New York beauty brands. And this year it's the brands that you see on the screen right now. So these brands come and pick the, basically the projects that they want the students to work on based on their needs. We don't control that. We say, hey, you've got this brain trust of students here. What do you need them to do to help you with your business? Um, the brands work with the students throughout the quarter and they kind of challenge them and motivate them and guide them so that they can get a really good exposure to what expectations will be, our, will be a year from now when they graduate and they get their own jobs. So the timing this year happened to be incredibly fortuitous as this project started right in April. So it started right as the shutdowns happened. And so of course, um, not unexpectedly, the brands that the projects that the brands brought forward were all pretty much related to COVID-19. Um, you know, they really asked the students to dive in and do extensive research on how the pandemic might affect different parts of their businesses. They asked things about how it's going to change brick and mortar. How is it going to shift the role of influencers? How is it going to increase the focus on the digital world? And these were all projects that the students dug into. So while Sammy and Shira didn't work on every single project, like the, of that. They worked on two to three, depending on the projects they were issued. Um, they're going to share with us the resu their results of their studies, as well as the results from some of their fellow classmates. So with that said, take it away, Lise. Thank you, Tina. So as Tina mentioned, we had this really unique opportunity to work with these brands and, and really figure out exactly what they were looking for as these changes with COVID occurred right as they were actually happening. So one of the biggest changes is the shift from physical to digital. And it's also not just that shift, but how do those worlds integrate together? E-commerce was already accelerating, but COVID has really just pushed that even further. Even generations that you would not normally think that are purchasing online, such as baby boomers, are actually seeing a 24% increase in their online purchases. But it's not just about the digital world, it's also how do we make the physical world back to life? The beauty industry kind of presents a very unique challenge because you know going into a store putting on makeup touching feeling products testing things out like you normally would it's not really possible anymore because it poses a lot of risk and one of the um, things we asked in one of our surveys that we conducted for one of our projects was as lockdowns start lifting how and where are you going to be shopping and most people selected that they would be shopping mostly online and sometimes in store so it's again, it's about the partnership between the two. So blending the physical, blending the digital and finding new ways to make them elevated and interesting for the new consumer. It's also about social media. That's another big aspect because the digital world is more than e-commerce. So that's really the through line that we're gonna be focusing on today throughout this presentation. Like said, the digital world has become even bigger due to COVID-19 especially what we found in our research was that there's been an uptick of mental health issues in this country stemming from the isolation that COVID-19 has caused. And because of this, there has been an increase in community online, mainly coming from the brands supporting people. First of all, consumers really want to feel comforted by the brands because this is a really difficult time that we're all living in and it's unprecedented and we have no idea what we're doing. So we see brands like Dose of Colors posting right as the entire country went into stay at home orders, be kind, be safe, be patient, which is a really comforting message to hear from one of your favorite brands. And it shows that these brands really do care for their consumers. 
because that's what's most important right now is the consumers knowing that these brands are there for them. And then also expressing that they, they're not just there for you, but you're part of their community and they're part of their family. Like Elf saying, we are one team and family. This is really showing that these brands are going to be here for you no matter what. And we're all going to get through this together, which is something that's really necessary in these times. So next we're going to be diving into brand activism. So similarly to what Sammy mentioned in regards to community, uh, consumers really want to see the brand reflect the values that they care about. This is pretty true across every generation, but this especially strikes a chord with Gen Z. 85% of Gen Z believe it's important for brands to play a bigger role in social issues at this time. But what does that exactly mean at this time? Because a lot has happened this year. One of those issues is the pandemic. We're seeing something like the Beauty Backed campaign, which supports uh, estheticians and other beauty industry professionals who are trying to get back to work in the UK. We're also seeing it affect mental health issues. As we just mentioned, that has been a huge rise because of the pandemic and because of the economic effects. So brands like Rare Beauty have launched their Rare Impact Fund, which raises money for mental health issues. And then of course, one of the other major changes this year has been the Black Lives Matter movement and overall just the focus on that. So historically, the beauty industry has not been a very inclusive space or a very diverse space. But this year, campaigns like the Pull Up or Shut Up movement are kind of turning that on its head and saying, how can we change? And, and the Pull Up or Shut Up movement in particular actually looks at the exact diversity statistics behind the brands we're seeing and, and seeing who's truly making those decisions. And then in addition to brand activism, something that's become very important to consumers is influencer activism. Consumers really want to follow influencers who are transparent about their viewpoints and their history because they want to follow people who reflect their viewpoints and history. So influencers being activists, not only for consumers, but for themselves has become essential during these times. We've seen influencers like Jen Atkins encouraging people to vote. People like Hiram saying that they are supporting peaceful protests while also supporting wearing your mask and promoting social distancing. All of these things are things that are really important to consumers and they want to see influencers talking about them because they know that they're real issues that affect all of our lives right now. What we've also seen is influencers taking an activist stance for themselves and talking about the inequities that they've experienced within the industry. Recently, we've seen that four agency was kind of called out for their discriminatory practices. Uh, at the beginning of the year, they launched something called the Freshman Class Initiative, which tried to include more diverse influencers into their agency. But what ended up happening was re very recently, it was found that they were not paying these black and non-white influencers as much as their white counterparts or at all. And we see people like Yvette coming out and talking about this and really reclaiming their image because it's been stripped away from these agencies that are just trying to capitalize off them and capitalize off their talents. So influencers really taking a stance for themselves has been super important in this time to show that they're worth it and every single one of their followers is also worth it. What we've also seen during this time are massive content shifts. Consumers right now really want comfort and support as well as entertainment and education from the influencers and the brands that they follow. So we've seen brands like Tatcha, who is very focused on Japanese tradition, talking about meditation and mindful thinking and talking about breathing exercises in order to show that they are there for their consumers and that they care about their well-being and want to show them tools to make their well-being even better. If it's not through their products, it's through practices like mindful meditation, which are very healthy for them. And then we also see influencers like Alana Davis, who is very high quality, full glam, taking the time during this pandemic to sit down authentically, low quality, no makeup, and just talk to her followers about how she's feeling during this pandemic. Because the most important thing is showing your authentic self. And people really want to see that they're not the only ones going through this. And then lastly, another huge content shift that we've seen is lo-fi content. You can see this in the rare beauty example with Selena Gomez that we have here. People are just really excited about seeing people in their natural environments, especially big celebrities like Selena Gomez, who they usually see in this huge production studio with all this makeup on. 
um, seeing people in their homes just like they see themselves when they record themselves on their phone is something that's really effective and has really resonated with audiences during this pandemic. So as Tina mentioned at the beginning, Sammy and I feel very lucky right now to be able to be working firsthand in the industry during this time. Sammy is working front lines actually in beauty retail and I'm working uh, interning at Hourglass in social media. So I have actually seen a lot of these first cha uh, firsthand changes with these content shifts. So you can see here on the left, we have an example of a very well-produced Instagram story. But on the right, this is one of our more recent Instagram stories simply filmed on a phone, it's in the talent's bathroom, and the text treatment is even done in the Instagram app. So this sort of shift from hi-fi content to lo-fi content actually boosted our Instagram story swipe ups by 34%. We also made some shifts during, uh, with, our con uh, with our caption strategy, excuse me. So one of the things we did was sort of imbue that comforting ability in, and that community into our captions. So you can see we said, how are you taking care of yourself today? and changing our captions to be a little bit more comforting and therefore our consumers allowed us to actually increase our comments by 67%. So next, we're gonna talk about new online. This was something specifically that when we were working with these brands for this New York project, um, they asked us to really look into some of these things. One of them is masterclasses and virtual events. This is sort of newer because typically in the beauty industry, launch parties are huge. There's influencers, there's decorations, it's a whole big thing. But now it's about how do we bring that to the online space but still make it interesting. You can see this example here is a Pat McGrath masterclass that she hosted on her IGTV. But Fenty has also done this and Hourglass has done this as well, which I will mention later. On the right here, we have something really cool, which is a 3D virtual store sort of like a VR, AR experience, but it's just for shopping. So this is a way that e-commerce, traditional e-commerce can be elevated and be a little bit more interesting. And again, it's fusing that digital and physical world together. So this example you're seeing is a store called Boutique. This actually was supposed to open earlier this year in New York, but instead opened virtually online because of the pandemic. We're seeing examples like this with Dior and Gucci as well. So across the board, it's really about how can we make these traditional things that we're used to doing in the physical world and turn them into the digital world? So next we're gonna be talking about virtual try-on and virtual consults. But before we dive into this, we want to ask you a question. So we're gonna launch a poll to ask you, pre-COVID, have you ever used a virtual try-on service or had a virtual consultation? So please go ahead and um, add in your answers there and then we will take a look at the results at the end. So virtual try-on is something really interesting because it essentially allows you to try on the products without posing any risk to contracting COVID. And this is something that we've seen a lot of brands do over the years, but it was sort of initially a gimmick. It was something fun and cool that brands were doing. Now we're really seeing this as a necessity that brands need to do. And the proof is, is really there because 75% of consumers are likely to use AR or a virtual try-on service like this when shopping. And it can also boost conversion by up to 250%. But part of the issue with virtual try-on is it's really missing that human connection that you might normally get when you're going into a store. So that is where virtual consultations come in. With virtual consultations, you're able to speak to um, a person from the brand one-on-one -on -one and really look. And there, that way that furthers the human connection, it furthers the comfort, it, it, it really helps bring in that whole community idea that we were mentioning at the beginning. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. So, wow, so the minority selected yes and 67% selected no. So this is pretty interesting, which is basically what I mentioned of how it was a gimmick at one point. Pre-COVID, this was not something that we necessarily were like needed all the time from every single brand and it was kind of just a fun thing. But I mean, the real question is now, how many of you guys would actually want to use this? And I think my guess is the majority would say yes, because it really allows you to experience those products or experience that one-on-one -on -one connection with the brand without posing any risk. So with virtual uh, try-on and virtual events, Hourglass, um, we launched a campaign that sort of incorporated both. So earlier this year, we launched our mascara 
the unlocked mascara. And as you can see here on the left, the reason there are these cute little bunnies is because um, it was to support an animal rights organization with the proceeds. So essentially we launched this AR filter on Instagram. And if followers posted using the AR filter, they could come join us in our virtual masterclass, which was our VIP makeup experience. So this sort of incorporates both because the AR filter is, is sort of like the virtual try-on, but in a more social media uh, sense. And then of course the masterclass is again, that typical launch party that we would have had in person, but, but in that digital sense. This campaign combined actually increased our followers by 584%. So this was a really amazing campaign and this mascara is one of our top selling products of the year. So now we've talked a lot about the switch from physical to digital, but we have to remember that the physical world still exists. So we're gonna talk about some changes in store that have really affected retailers. So the first of these is just new layouts for stores, whether it's making appointments for your consumers or having curbside pickup available, um, having social distancing measures, like having markers on the floor and plexiglass at the registers. And we've also seen a lot of tester innovations, a lot of future thinking ways for us to be sampling makeup because at the end of the day, the biggest issue that we've had so far with this pandemic is that beauty is a sensory experience. We wanna smell our fragrances in our products. We wanna to touch them and feel them, we wanna see how they're gonna look on us. And during a pandemic, that's kind of hard to do. So retailers have really had to find new ways to enable people to test products. One of these has been the Mayu May Touchless Fragrance Sampler that you see here. It just dispenses fragrance so people don't have to come in any contact with it, but they can still test fragrance, which was one of the biggest questions at the beginning of the pandemic was how are people going to be able to smell fragrance if they're wearing masks and can't touch anything? And then in the real world, while this is super future thinking, us as retailers, we've had to just adapt in the moment to whatever we can do. Personally, working at NAMI's, working in the front lines, when we reopen, reopen during phase two or phase three, we were presented with this challenge of, well, what do we do with our testers now? And we had to come up with the ideas of shrink wrapping them and trying things like gorilla gluing our lipstick shut and putting clear caps on top of some of them so people can still see the colors. So it's just gonna be an ever-changing thing and it's one of those things where retailers really need to decide what is going to be best for them to implement the safest environment for their consumers as well as their employees. And then another issue we have seen because of COVID is operational issues. There's been a lot of delays in manufacturing which cause backups in the supply chain, which means you might be getting an ingredient from Italy, but a component from France, and then you're manufacturing in China, and then you have to ship all the way across the ocean to us. That ends up taking so much more time because all of these operations are operating at half capacity because of social distancing measures. And a lot of people are working remotely, so the commun communication is even more cut off, which is causing lower stock in stores, which is then causing a loss of consumer loyalty. And it has been seen that 75% of consumers have been looking at alternatives to their favorite products right now because of low stock in stores due to COVID-19. Another thing that we've seen in operational issues is product development pushbacks. A lot of brands have had to consider whether it is appropriate for them to be launching products right now or not. One big example that we saw in the news was the Jeffree Star cremated palette. It was supposed to launch in March of this year, but he had to push it back. Um, and it was a big question of if it was going to come out at all during this year or not. And he ended up launching it in May. Um, and it received a huge amount of media backlash because it was called cremated. And during a global pandemic, it was this palette that all the shade names were somewhat mocking or making fun of the concept of death, where a lot of people around the globe were suffering because of this pandemic. So it's really the onus of the brands to think about whether it's better for them to absorb those costs from product development pushbacks or absorb the costs from a PR nightmare if your audience isn't very receptive to your launch. 
All right, so now we're gonna talk about category trends and we are actually going to launch another poll just seeing what you guys are most interested in with category trends. And while you answer that, we're just gonna be going over the biggest trends that we've seen in our research from COVID-19. The first of these being minimalist makeup. Obviously, we've all been working from home and because of that, we've been wearing less makeup whether it's because we're getting more comfortable with ourselves or we just don't feel like we're wear we want to wear more makeup or it's because the masks that we're wearing are congesting our face. People have really been turning to scaling down their makeup routines as well as their skincare routines to make them as simple as possible while still being effective. On that note, like I said, people are wearing masks more, which is causing a lot of adult acne, what we're calling mask me. So there has been a rise of acne products, especially in adults, because these products were originally targeted towards teens. And now we're seeing that all age ranges are having to use them because of the skin imperfections that masks are causing. Another huge thing that we've seen is at-home hair color. I am a living, breathing example of coloring my hair at home all the time. And in the pandemic, that has just increased. And we've seen that at home hair color sales have boosted 115% since the start of the pandemic. So nearly doubled, if not more, which is very exciting for these brands. And also just shows that people really are taking their beauty routines into their own hands and learning how to do things by themselves, which is great. Um, the next biggest thing has been wellness and clean beauty. Uh, we've seen that 72% of consumers are really looking for products that are healthy and that are clean and people want to take care of their bodies. And then the last thing that we have seen is that eye makeup has really soared during the pandemic because people can only show the upper half of their face. A lot of people want to do bold makeup to show off their eyes. So we've seen that brands are reporting a 40 to 64% rise in their eye makeup sales. So now looking at the information from the poll um we see that skincare a lot of you guys are purchasing more skincare about 50 percent of you actually which is really interesting and i think just uh hones into the fact that we are really thinking about our own wellness in terms of the health of our skin as well as suffering with this idea of mask me and needing to adapt our routines to that All right, so to conclude, what we've really found from this project is that the beauty industry is always changing. Things like wearing masks every day are things we never thought we would do back in January, but now it's just become part of our daily routine. And like Tina said at the beginning, we maybe didn't see so many inequalities in the beauty industry before, but now we are really seeing that consumers and brands want to talk about it and want it even more than ever. It's not even just a want, it's a need for diversity and inclusivity. So to basically wrap it up, we really do believe that 2020 will have a permanent effect on the beauty industry in terms of the authenticity requested from these brands and these influencers. Um, but at the same time, we have to remember that the beauty industry is cyclical and things will always evolve and hopefully they will keep evolving for the better. And even though we are in hard times right now, we are learning stuff about our society and our industry that we may have never realized before. And COVID-19, while it has presented some challenges, has also made some beautiful revolutions for the beauty industry that will change it for the course of history. Ladies, thank you so much. I mean, that was so informative and so amazing. I know you guys, you know, all you, your, you and your fellow classmates worked incredibly hard on these projects and I know the brands were amazed and every time I hear it, I am even more impressed with you and just so proud of you. So excellent work. Um, and thank you for such great insights. You know, it's definitely a fascinating window into how quickly the beauty industry was affected by COVID and how quickly it had to pivot. And as we talked about getting ready for this, 
this, you know, you, you, you even mentioned that even in just the two months since you guys completed these studies, so much continues to change and evolve, even from what you presented today. You're like, I think everything shifted again. So uh, it's great to see this. So thank you. And we're going to bring you back for the, the Q&A session and get some questions maybe on some of this research and your findings and your personal opinions on this. So come on back right after we're done. All right. So don't go far. But now let me pivot it over to Robin. So um, I wanna bring Robin back on screen. Hey, Robin. All right, so um, Robin's gonna help us now understand how these changes will continue and how the industry is gonna need to shift even further. I'm gonna change the format a little bit. We're gonna do this more of a Q&A. We think it's a little more comfortable to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation kind of thing going instead of the formal, hi, let me put up the talking head. So let me just kind of get into it. So. Robin, this must be an incredibly exciting time for you. Um, you know, you're, you're, you've got this consulting agency leading Holistic Beauty Group, and which focuses on clean and sustainable and safe ingredients. And now, whoa, you know, all of a sudden, um, this is such a big deal. I mean, and it was, but, you know, did you have any idea when you started the company how relevant and important um, your focus on the side of this industry yeah. was going to be? I had the feeling. So when I was in corporate beauty working, you know, at major brands, I was that advocate. I was always the one pushing for clean, pushing for fair trade, you know, reviewing co consumer complaints and questions about ingredients. I was working with various packaging engineers and, you know, I knew that there was a wave coming, that the consumer was changing. They were becoming smarter. And we couldn't just tell them anything and just do anything and make any kind of product. So I felt like for me, everything really connected when I walked the first um, Indie Beauty Expo in mm -hmm. LA back in like 2016. Mm -hmm. And I saw like these little brands doing everything that I was thinking about and talking about internally within these organizations. And I wanted to be a part of that wave. And hell, like I was the wave. I was like, I wanted to be a part of this movement. And so I took my 16 years of experience and became that product developer for those brands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, excellent timing. And you do, you have led this wave, you know, you've been so integral in it. And so that, and it, that comes from the passion and, you know, certainly we've both been in industry a long time and there, you could see that level of frustration of why can't we get these brands to pivot? So having you do that, uh, you know, it's great, but in that note though you got you focus a lot on new product development and a number of the reasons a lot of the brands say they can't pivot is they're just saying you know the materials aren't there or there's just logistical issues and stuff and i know that covid has greatly also impacted the pd process so you know for you how do you see this shift in the pd process you know we're not only changing our focus on types of packaging but now we can't even get the packaging so how do you see that evolving as we move forward well, I think, you know, the biggest sort of immediate impact to product development were our timelines. And so the ladies, you know, they touched on operational issues. So, you know, we had a launch scheduled for a hair brand that I was working with for April in Ulta doors that got pushed back to June based on components being late from China. So there's so many dollar implications that happened that was really devastating to the industry. And I think now people are just starting to sort of bounce back and come back from that. I think long-term impact is really how like we're putting products together and we're doing it virtually. And actually I like it better. You know, before we used to have to jump on a plane to solve problems. And, you know, while I miss my emergency trips to Italy, like it's so much better to know that we can just zoom through it. Now we can get on a virtual zoom, no matter the time and kind of work through things. So I think working virtually through troubleshooting issues as it relates to manufacturing and building products, I see that not changing. I see people feeling like, you know, we can get a lot more done and be more productive. Um, I think, you know, virtual on sites is a way that we're gonna see product development evolve. So as you know, product developers travel a lot. We go, we do on site shade matchings at the lab. We work on formulas, we um, approve standards. There's a lot of things that we do on site at manufacturing um, facilities. And so now we're doing all of that virtually. And, you know, we're, we have, you know, I was talking to a product developer at a Smashbox Cosmetics who has a light box now in her, in her house. And so we're figuring it out. And I think that 
you know, basically spending less time in the air and more time present and just figuring it out virtually. I think that's a shift that is going to be a long-term impact that I think is, is really for the best. So you think that's working? I mean, I think that was one of the reasons so many companies fought it. They're like, well, how on earth am I supposed to be able to do this from home? I mean, and you're mm -hmm. just seeing the technology is supporting that now? I do. I think that we've had to work through it. And I think now we, we're figuring it out and it's like we can get so much more done um, in a day. You know, I can oversee three pilot batches virtually on Zoom. I mm. could you know, meet with clients. I can, you know, can be in three different work. countries in one day. <laughs> <laughs> I can do my work. I can go home to dinner. There's so much that I can now accomplish in a day. And so I find this to be a very interesting pivot and maybe for the best. I mean, I'm going to still sort of miss the human interaction. Um, and so that's the other issue. But I do think that we're able to do so much more now because we're not fighting against the technology. You know, we're embracing it. That's awesome. But I mean, on that note, right, you're saying so now there's less interaction, right? And a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's the interaction that motivates my creativity. It's the interaction that gives me this innovation. I mean, even the trade shows and things, right? Yeah. So how do you do that now? How do you find innovation and inspiration for new products in this new world? Has that changed? I mean, I doubt yeah. you're going out to the stores and testing all the competitive products anymore. Yes, I mean, there's virtual summits. Um, I had to get used to them, but there are a lot of virtual summits popping up. You know, beauty independent webinars. I'm doing online, I'm using my online trend resources, WGSN. That's one of my favorites. I've been using it for years. And really, I think, really, Tina, just going back to simplicity, you know, maybe an, your next iconic hero product isn't about the craziest, trendiest CBD ingredient. Maybe it's about the way that we're speaking to an emerging generation about self-compassion and self-care. Maybe we need to innovate in our approach and in our messaging. I think um, instead of searching, um, look around. You know, we see that there's this, there's this need for essential care, elevated hygiene, and anxiety-soothing products that really elevate the consumer experience. I think innovating for the consumer need state is the answer. And I think once you go there, there's like an abundance of inspiration. So just look around, you know, there's so many, we talked about maskne um, earlier, you know, there you go. That's, um, that is a new emerging category trend that you can go after and, and really innovate. So I think we have so much to work with by just virtually just looking around. Well, I also think too, I think we've had to force ourselves to slow down and listen to consumers enough now, and we have a better way to access them than we ever did you know, um, and to get that feedback, right? To be able to understand their needs because they're putting it out online, right? Um, right. So, you know, but, all right, so there's a lot of things, uh, you know, that have caused issues, a lot of things that worry people, a lot of things that get in the way. Where's the bright spot? You know, how are you finding, you know, what, how, do you, how are you seeing your light at the end of this tunnel, Robin? What's the light? Mm -hmm. I think there's two big bright spots that I've seen. So, um, let's run, let's run my first poll. So the, the poll that I had, I had a question about where are you shopping beauty? So if we can run that poll, why I asked this question, I think, um, what I've seen with COVID is that with the shift to digital, we're seeing that it's leveling the playing field for indie brands to thrive. So we're seeing that yes, some brands are really suffering. Those brands that were indoors, that were shut in the department stores and such, but we're also seeing that brands that know how to authentically communicate with their audience via social or TikTok or whatever, those brands are thriving. So it's really leveling the playing field. And so we're seeing minority owned brands, um, you know, experiencing radical growth. Um, and it's really amazing to see from my point of view, I've seen these brands out here hustling for years and all of a sudden they're up 1500%. And I think that's what COVID is really doing. I think people are really starting to care about who they're supporting, who they're getting behind with their dollar. And so um, I still see that most people are just sharing the poll results. Most people are still shopping those bigger retailers, Ulta and Sephora, but we see 21% of you um, shopping indie brands and online. And that used to be much lower. That yeah. was like five, 10%. So I think that's really exciting. Um, so I think that's one bright spot. Another bright spot for me is sustainability. So this is something that 
I've been working on for a long time. And, you know, now it's here. We, we talk about sustainability. It's a buzzword. But um, I think what COVID has done, the great pause of 20, 2020, is now we see the skies getting brighter. We see the ocean clearing up. We see the dolphins swimming and, you know, and the um, Venice and canals. Italy, all that stuff in the canals. And so we see that what we have done to the earth can be reversed. Now the consumer is now holding brands and industry more accountable and even industry, you know, brands are starting to really take, you know, climate um, change very seriously. You know, um, uh, Credo, they launched a new packaging standard that is basically banning single use plastics. You know, things are changing and happening at a much faster rate than it was before. So I think it's, it's changing forever. So I'm really excited to see where sustainable, sustainability goes. It's a much more uh, scientifically measured um, data point versus just a, a talking point. So I'm excited about um, sustainability and more people hearing about it. I agree with you. I love now that their brands can be measured on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of, you know, we've got the sustainability, the clean issue, but also the students brought it up, right? We still, we have the Black Lives Matter and the diversity issue. They're, they're both so strong and they both come so forward with COVID, you know, and obviously you were profiled as one of the top 25 Black women in the beauty industry in 2020. So, you know, the beauty is she, uh, you know, as um, Sammy mentioned, it coming under fire for its lack of diversity and inauthenticity, inauthenticity can't even say that word, right? So, uh, when it comes to inclusion. And, and we know that, and it's kind of been something the industry has like been in trouble with, and now it's having, it's getting called to the mat on it, right? And, and I know this is a very important issue for you. So what does, you know, what does the future of racial inequality and inclusion look like for beauty brands now and beyond? I mean, how real is it gonna be? How do they make it, how, do, how does a brand that historically hasn't all of a sudden does? Mm -hmm. I think what the moment brought is awareness at the corporate and retail level. I think in the past, um, we wanted to just see ourselves, you know, as people of color, black and indigenous people of color. We just wanted to see ourselves in the marketing. We wanted to see ourselves in the ad. We wanted to be a part of it. Now it's like, we want to participate, right? So that's what pull up and shut up was about that Sammy had mentioned earlier. It's about participation when we, not just beauty, but when you have brands like Adidas that is historically known to market through black culture and have zero representation and um, around, you know, the boardroom, that's problematic. And so I think that is now where we're at is looking for participation, a seat at that table, you know, not just marketing to the consumer for their dollar, but, you know, that inclusion piece, I think, is becoming more real. And where I see it changing most is um, at the corporate level and also at the retail level, because retailers with, you know, movements like 15% pledge, we're seeing that happening. We're seeing accelerators happening. I'm actually seeing a lot of work, and I didn't expect it. A lot of times people, you know, were using Black Lives Matter as a marketing um, moment. And I do think that, you know, we're starting to see more and more um, corporate inclusivity, but where we need to shift, where we have to do better is really in the capital. I see a lot of brands that are people of color led who don't have access to capital. Um, investors pump a lot of money into the beauty industry. They much rather invest in a white celebrity, you know, supplement brand than a group of indigenous like, but brilliant women who want to change the world with their healing product. Yeah. So we need to see that happen in that shift. And I'm hoping, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that things will start to get there because of these types of forms and these types of conversations. I, you know, when I talk to my mother, who's in her seventies, she's like, you know, when we were fighting for civil rights, when I was coming up, white people weren't standing with us then white people are standing with you now. So this is very different. This is, this is, you may see a change, you know, and so I'm very optimistic about it. And I just hope that we keep pushing, um, you know, in the right direction. I hope so too. You know, I really do. Been here a long time. It's nice to see these changes. Mm -hmm. so. I could keep talking to you all day, um, but I'm going to end up pivoting right now. So I'm going to yeah. stop and I'm going to bring you back to Q&A. Okay, so go away, but don't go far. And then um, Inger, I would love to bring you back on screen so we can get your turn and, and help have you talk to us from the marketing focus. All right. So 
Um, you know, obviously you, you do marketing, you've done marketing for a long time. And we know that the, the one gift of a marketer is that being a fortune teller, right? Everyone wants that marketer who's going to be able to look into the crystal ball and tell us all what's going to happen. But, you know, you've been pretty good at it and, and you've got a, a good feel for it. So, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about the future of the beauty industry. All right. So welcome and thank you for being here. I'm going to start with asking you about new categories emerging, right? Do you think we're going to get, you know, we saw skincare's emerging and things like that, but do you think we're going to get whole new categories or do you think we're just going to get a shift in focus on existing categories? I think we're going to get a little shift in both. So what I've really seen is our claim marketing changing. And a lot of the times, as we talked about, there's been a hard time to get new products on shelf. And so a lot of brands are looking back at like their core and we saw huge surges in like hero products. And typically when we look at these big brands, only like 10 to 15 products make up like 60% 6 of the overall revenue. Mm -hmm. So one of the things specifically at NYX, when the pandemic hit, um, we went and looked and we were looking for all of our products that had no transfer claims. I think no transfer as a category um, is con going to continue to be something that's going to be very, very important, not only for the mask wearing, um, but in general, just um, having that long wear performance claim. Mm -hmm. So I think as it relates to core products, the categories that offer no transfer. Um, another huge fortune telling category that I see as a huge success um, is what the pandemic pandemic has done for brows. So think about everyone who was going into the salon to get wax plucked, like, trust me, I don't want to touch my brows completely eliminated. Everyone had to have to do either not have to live with what their brows actually look like. Um, and so there's going to be and is a huge shift in like bigger, bushy, fuller brows. So that's going to be a huge category that we're going to see emerging. Specifically, right now, there's a trend in brow lamination. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at SEO terms, brow mm -hmm. lamination is up 300%. And that's where it was three years ago when we started to see the uptick in um, microblading for brows. Mm -hmm. So brow lamination and products that have either the ability to give you brow lamination at home without going to the salon mm -hmm. or products that can really create full bushy brows to enhance your brows when you're not going in the salon are going to be huge emerging categories, especially from a mask wearing perspective, like your brows and your eyes are what is being seen and where people are still like in a minimalistic way, being able to still kind of wear makeup in that section. Mm -hmm. um, and then last from not least from like an emerging perspective, I think everything is starting to get like a skincare twist, but now skincare that's safe. So things that promote safety, whether that's antibacterial brush cleaning, whether that's setting sprays that are going to help with like UV and protection against the environment. Um, we're going to start Please. seeing shift in that direction. So I would say claims on existing uh, the brow category, I, I, I'm rubbing my ball right now. <laughs> Anyone who wants to start a brand, start a brow lamination brand. Um, and then like just the safe, clean. it's not just clean anymore, it's clean and safe. Oh, okay, great, excellent. So, you know, um, so we know that it's not just the categories changing, right? We've talked about that, the, the students presented that. And, you know, working for Nix, you were heavily involved in a diverse assortment of marketing programs. I mean, you guys led the whole initiative with working with influencers in the beginning with your um, competition, you know, but so I know marketing shifting as well. And I know you're kind of having to pivot that. So what are some of the ways that COVID, COVID has affected, not, you know, putting categories aside, how you actually now market those categories or how you market those products and find a way to break through when it's all online? Yeah, yeah, I think I think we've hit on it in all topics from the students to Robin and I'll reiterate it like there was a huge delay in product. Mm -hmm. So as a marketer, I'm sometimes having to pitch and develop a product without even touching and feeling it or like knowing like what it actually performs like. And that's, I think the biggest testament to Robin kind of hit on it, looking for different ways of innovation that aren't just necessarily like tactical touch and feel from like an, when K Beauty came out, it was all about like how you're gonna experience this product and create new textures and forms and marketers aren't even getting their hands 
hands on things to be able to even like experience that. So mm -hmm. what's happened is you really have to look at the competition and really cut down to like, what is the single most important point of view on this product and what makes me different and it's and it's all about simplifying your marketing um, mm -hmm. so you can cut through and I think that when we look at um, like Katy Perry just dropped her new album um, but before that she dropped smile they're dropping like one song at a time they're letting that play out they're hitting it big and then they're moving on to the next and I think from a marketing standpoint for product uh, we've seen a shift in cadence so you're seeing brands come out with one product at a time with one big idea one strong point of difference really marketing on that getting it in the hands of every influencer Mm -hmm. getting it um, exposed. And then once that sizzles down, then move to the next. Um, mm -hmm. There are some emerging brands, but specifically with one size, we launched with two products. Yeah. Yeah, um, and now we're great. launching three more. And um, we're, we just had a call with Sephora. We're one of their their best-selling brands, number one makeup remover for them across categories um, in skincare right now. And I just think that that model um, is going to be very powerful as we move into um, the way of like not being able to tactilely touch products and have to think out of sight of the box. Simpler stories, more focused stories, right? Single heroes. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, part of that, even though we talk about a lot about products being sold online, part of that is you can't get online and you can't get in stores unless you get to a retailer, right? Um, and I know in my day, right, it was about getting that appointment, flying across the country, sitting there for a half hour, your hour, giving your pitch and trying to explain your product and having them touch it and feel it and sense it, you know, and they would critique it, right? So that's kind of not happening anymore right so and i know like you, you're trying to get your products into these new retailers in, in your role at one size so how do you present to retailers now how do you gain distribution how how do you has it changed and how do you see it evolve continuing to change yeah it's, it's definitely evolved so i mean one of the things that i think we've had to all up our skill in is like powerpoint like back in the day, you could just put a PowerPoint slide together, but now you might not even be able to present. So you're like one sheet on a PowerPoint slide needs to be beautifully designed. It needs to have your clear point of view and it needs to almost speak for itself. Mm. Um, also, like we talked about, we can't get samples for marketers. There's no way we're getting samples for several different retail partners that want to give it to their boss to then show to their other boss to be able to touch and feel. And these retailers are scared. They have millions of dollars of inventory that they're sitting on. They, the last thing they want to do is take in a new product that they've never touched and feel and they have a PowerPoint slide that they don't even understand what it means. So everyone's got to up their game. And one of the things that um, we've been doing is we actually are partnering really closely with product development and even our suppliers to send us videos. Send us videos of the product being applied on the hand, where test. Um, I actually have one that I can share with everyone today. Yep. Um, and when we play it, I mean, this was one of the first one Nix did. Six months later, we are now like sending content out to like our Instagram, like feed people to like make these videos that are going to take it to the next levels because we really want to be able to sell it in better and quicker and be get a better buy-in and, and videos have really been key in selling it. So I'll, I'll show an example, but this was just like one of the first ones and it went over so successfully. Epic wear flash metals in eight highly reflective new shades. This thin tipped brush allows for fine metallic lines along with easy one swipe application. These gorgeous new shades also set without smudging. So this is something you would originally you developed to send it to a retailer. Yeah, we, we literally, we did that like on iPhone with a PD team and, and luckily our, one of our product development people had really good like editing skills, but now we're actually sending it to like an influencer, like quickly, like, can you like do a really beautiful product video? And then we've like taken it up to the next level and retailers are eating it up. They're like, please send more. And they're able to make purchase decisions without even touching products now. So now you're not just using influencers to sell to your consumer. You're using influencers to sell to your retailer. Yeah. 
Nice. And they're creating the content for you. Yeah. Ingenious. No wonder you're because, good at marketing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they're getting the first look at product. So it's also like a ratings and review opportunity because then when we actually launch and post the product, the influencer is able to say like, oh, I had this during the development stage. I've had it behind the scenes for a couple of months. And so all of that has just really worked into like our product development, our seeding, and um, it's been working really well. Nice, nice. All right, so we have time for one last question and then I'm going to take it over to Q&A. So we know that now distribution, everyone keeps talking about how it's shifting over to online, right? That everything, that consumers are now shopping through online. Um, and as we mentioned a few times, you know, where consumers are shopping and we even did our own survey, right? But do you really think it's going to be a permanent shift to online? This is the big question, right? So here's your, I'm looking at, I'm just going to look in that crystal ball again. Do you think consumers will gravitate back to brick and mortar as much as they used to? Are we going to want that tactile? Or do you think the shift has happened and it's not going to change? So I, uh, I had a longer answer, but for time, I'm going to give you my short crystal ball answer, which is I think the brands that seamlessly integrate their D to C business with their on with their brick and mortar. Those are the ones that are going to be recession proof. They're going to be pandemic proof because they need to be able to have the flexibility to shift based on what the consumer wants before the pandemic hit online and brick and mortar was kind of like, what was, what was going to happen? We saw online merging, but then people still wanted the experience in store. And then pandemic hit um, five years ago, it was 20% of the sales were done online. Uh, at pandemic, it was like 100% of the sales are done online. And I think one, it's going to be depend on the brand. But two, I just see like, to me, the curbside pickup, like, I can't, I, as a marketer, I'm like, this is amazing. Like, I don't think that's going to go away. Yeah. I think that's a perfect example of like merging a D to C business mm -hmm. with a brick and mortar environment and how you can seamlessly connect the two. And I think, I think that's where the future is headed. That's awesome. No, it makes total sense. I, I would agree. I'd like to have time. Yeah, you know, if it's a market research study of one, yeah, <laughs> I'm it, right? All right. Well, thank you. I want to bring everybody back. Um, I want to give some chance for Q&A and kind of answer some of the questions that have come up, as well as some of the ones that were submitted to me online. So I want to make sure we get to those. So welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much again. Um, so I want to kind of see uh, questions. One, I guess, you know, let me bounce this to you, Inger. I have a question here. Um, what tips do you have for college students to find jobs in the beauty industry in the midst of the pandemic? I mean, you know, it was one of the things you and I were prepared to talk about anyway. What is it that now, um, what skills are going to be important for people as they start looking for jobs? Yeah, I, I love that question because I, I have to just say, I feel very fortunate. My husband tells me this all the time. He's like, you got a job during the global pandemic. Like I, we said, I, I started a week ago. And um, so I think one of the most important skills is, is utilizing LinkedIn. That's how I got my job. Before I used to be recruited, my last two jobs were all done by recruiters. And nowadays, with digital becoming a big thing, like online jobs is becoming like where people find jobs. So LinkedIn was where I got my job. Start building your profile on LinkedIn. And then from a skill standpoint, it's so important more than ever to just take your professionalism to the next level. I think with work from home, um, one size is a brand that's permanently work from home. I'm never going back into the office. Wow which is insane. I have friends that are losing their leases and they're just going to go permanent work from home as well for smaller brands. And so you have to be able to man manage and prioritize your work-life balance. Your boss does not want to have to micromanage you. They're already putting more time into their day. And so you have to bring your professionalism to the a whole new level of professionalism. And then I would say the other most important thing is communication. Be uh -huh. very sharp and clear in your communication. You have to lead people without ever physically being there. You have to tell them exactly 
what you want, how you want it, when you want it, recap meeting notes. And so I would say that um, get on LinkedIn. Um, the bigger brands aren't really hiring right now. It's the smaller emerging brands robbing the indie brands. And I think for a new student coming into this environment with strong professionalism, clear communication, LinkedIn indie brand, it's, it's going to be great. You guys are going to just, your careers are going to fly. I mean, it's one of the things we keep stressing to students, the ones who've hesitated to take classes online. We're like, um, this skill set is now one of the major things you need on your resume. You know, I can do this online. I can take in projects and submit projects and communicate. And yeah, so thank you. I just had to get that into the students that are yeah, no, it's, so, uh, you know, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, we do have a question for the students. I want to bump to that. So Sammy and Shira, the question is, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen between your your initial research and the research for this panel specifically you know I mean like we talked about those, those shifts right the two months what's something that's kind of your being been your big aha well I think at the beginning all of the guidelines for our projects were COVID based what is COVID gonna do because at the beginning we didn't know if quarantine was gonna last two weeks or go on for an entire year Obviously now we're in the midst of it and we still don't know when it's gonna end. But all those questions were around what's gonna happen with COVID. But even as we were doing our project, um, the Black Lives Matter protest started up and people started becoming more concerned with a variety of things and people's attention really shifted from just the pandemic to, okay, how is our entire life being affected by this? Not just our ability to go outside and see people. Um, so I think that was probably the biggest shift from this was when we were first asked, it was really about COVID specifically, but now it's about 2020 because 2020 in itself has been such an eventful year that has changed so much. Like we're going to look back at this year in 40 years and people are going to be taking history classes and talk about what a weird time this was. Yeah, and it wasn't just COVID, right? So it's sort of that, no. that, the, that the, the whole movement became so much bigger than just the COVID issue, right? Great. Shira, did you have anything in particular you've noticed that shifted a lot or something you learned about that's kind of been fascinating to you? Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things, um, just besides the shift that Sammy just mentioned, but also like we are working as these things are happening. So some of the things we predicted, like, you know, I did all this research on virtual try-ons, virtual consultations, virtual stores. And then it's like, okay, now I'm at Hourglass. We're launching an AR filter. We're launching a virtual event. And so just seeing like that literally come to fruition right in front of me was a really, really cool experience. And then plus seeing the numbers and seeing how has that truly affected things and, and the true, you know, the win of that. Yeah. So that's one thing I can think of. And, and secondly, um, we also did a little bit of future forecasting, which we didn't touch on too much today. But one of the things we researched a lot was UV technology and UV lights, especially in store and, and utilizing that to sanitize products. And we're seeing that come, come to play a little bit now. Um, I know Sammy works at a professional makeup store and there a lot of the professional artists are actually being required to use UV technology to um, sanitize their makeup kits for when they go work on movie sets. So that's just like a little bit of it. I mean, some of these are so future thinking that it's gonna be looking at, okay, next year, what's really happening and, and the year after that. But, but yeah, it's been a really interesting experience. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Rob, let me throw in your way that came from, a, um, she's an incoming student and, you know, focusing on PD. And she says, with the importance of sampling and single use products to keep safe, have there been any trends or innovations that have been catered to sustainability um, while keeping things safe? So yeah, we're, we're moving over. Now, one of the things that's happened, right, everything's become trial size, so you can sample it. That kind of goes against the whole sustainability ability green, doesn't it? I mean, how it, how are we melding that trials and samples with saving the world? Yeah, it's it's no silver bullet. You know, it's it's really about making mindful choices in the materials and terms of in terms of the packaging. So we're seeing, you know, much more um, availability of bioresins and PCR. Um, available from a packaging standpoint, but I've actually had a lot of brands sort of start pulling back on their sampling programs. I don't know if you're seeing that, Inger, but people not putting that into the assortment as heavily. We know sampling and trialing is super um, important, but I've seen a lot of brands pulling back from it. 
Um, and, you know, just eliminating all of those deluxe sizes and trial sizes um, all together. And so I'm not sure, honestly, where it will go, but I am sure that, you know, brands are not only looking for safe ways to get trial out there, but um, they're looking for sustainable ways and cost-effective ways. And so there's, you know, a lot of inventory that people are sitting on and, you know, sampling is also very expensive. Um, it almost costs the same as to make, you know, a smaller size product. So I think we're going to see, it'll be good to kind of revisit this question, Tina, honestly, next year, because I'd love to see where it ends. But I do think that there is, there are more options, um, sustainable packaging options, but I just don't think that is necessarily the silver bullet. I think how we experience product for the first time um, may just move to digital. It may, it may move to virtual. It's, it's okay. um, an ever video, right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, Ingrid, I think I'm going to throw this question at you. You know, how do you keep customers engaged on the online world at this point? Are they saturated of everything being online now? I mean, now we've got, yeah, if that's, if we shop so much, do we, do consumers just start to become numb to it? How do you break through? I think, I think there's two things. I think they're at home, so they're trying to absorb content. So um, breaking through, I think, is maybe not as big as a barrier as before, where, you know, people are at home and they're absor absorbing more content than ever before. But I think that's where it comes down to, like, that strong point of difference. And I think that mnemonics are very important. So when you're launching a product, like, for example, we launched an Epic Wear pencil, um, and we decided to, like, stencil the word Epic on the face, and that became our mnemonic for the campaign. And so you really need to create something that visually that's ownable and epic was the name of our product so everything needs to start to seamlessly speak like to your product to your visual um to the way that you name it the way that you talk to it and so that when someone looks at something they know it's that it's your brand and i think that when you, you have to pay to play so by having like really clear communication knowing the consumers out there looking for new products and having like a killer point of view and a point of difference i think it'll be easy to cut through especially with the help of like digital and social and like profiling customers if you have the money and you're a big brand like you'll get there and then to robin's point the the brands that have you know that that are indie that have like a really cool point of view from mental health i think um, those brands are going to be seen and going to be heard because people are looking for solutions and, and wanting to absorb more products while they're sitting at home. <laughs> I mean, it always comes down to creativity, doesn't it? Innovation, creativity, breakthrough, taking a different approach. Here's Sam, I'm going to bounce this one to you. For um, What is the future of influencers and their place in the beauty industry? <laughs> that oh, God. CW is doing a whole webinar on that one coming up, but, you know, um, talk we can kind of tighten it in for you a little bit. You and I had talked earlier about one of the big shifts you see in influences. I don't think you see that changing. So maybe talk to that a little. Yeah, I mean, from this pandemic and from this year, what we've seen is that people really are craving authenticity in their influencers. They really want influencers to be true and be honest and also care about their image and the image they're projecting. Um, we've seen countless influencers being canceled and giving apologies this year. And what the difference is this year versus last year is that consumers aren't just taking their apologies at face value. You know, Shane Dawson and Jeffree Star have apologized countless times for the things that they've done in their past. But this year was the breaking point. And people are really the past of these influencers who have been on the internet for a very long time and are taking that into consideration. And because of that, I think one of the main things that is important for brands and consumers to do is look into micro influencers and look at the influencers that really reflect you and reflect you as a brand because the micro influencers are the ones that are able to create these authentic communities full of people who care about their craft and care about the industry in general. And that's really gonna be the key to good influencer marketing. Thank you. I'm scrolling through these questions and I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to answer that one. Oh my gosh, I want to put that one out. And I've also got like my host telling me, Tina, <laughs> cut it. So I'm going to give you guys my email address, those of you that um, put questions in. If you email me the questions and you know specifically who you want them to go to, or if it's general, 
Um, if you send them to me, I will forward them on to the various panelists and see if they can get some insights. There's some really good questions that I think they can address and we just don't have the time to do that today. So I want to thank everybody so much for taking the times out of your lives. I know you're super busy, Inger starting a brand new job, Robin like highly in demand these days for your skill set. So um, again, and then Sammy and I know, Shira, I know how busy you are with finals coming up next week. So, you know, awesome. And thank you for that time. So this wraps it up.